Hi, I'm Kevin Tates, and I want to say thank you to the Eastwood Company for having us here to, uh, to talk to you guys about some of the challenges of welding light-duty sheet metal, uh, predominantly what you'd run into during panel replacement, restoration work, putting floor pans in, door skins, patch panels, whatever. It can present quite a challenge, so rather than... Um, uh, rather than uh, making bridge parts or building trailers, there's a unique set of, of parameters that uh, you know, light duty sheet metal um, presents in some some problems. And so, what we're going to do is, is give you guys some tips that uh, that hopefully can help you with your projects at home. Keep in mind, underneath the screen that you're seeing, uh, you'll see the products that we're using here that are available to you guys in the Eastwood catalog. Um, I've got an outline here that we're going to be following, and feel free to ask questions or uh, contact me either on uh, Kevin's Corner on the Eastwood Restoration Forum. Uh, there's different ways to get in touch with us, as well as a ton of really good uh, information resources on the Eastwood website. This is one of the things I like the most about Eastwood, is that they're all about sharing and empowering and making sure that your stuff goes as good as you want to and that your projects turn out the best possible way. Um, so what we're going to do Let's talk a little bit about safety. I'm not going to hammer. I'm not going to beat you to death. We're going to be making sparks real soon. Um, and also, uh, just a quick rundown. We're going to be talking about setting up your welder. We're going to be talking about finding the gauge that you're working on, testing your machine beforehand, uh, doing things like rosette welds or plug welds. Um, how to properly clean your substrate, and as well as uh, some of the finer points of welding sheet metal on a late model fender that uh, will translate to whatever type of work that you're doing. So, safety. Look at this jacket. You can get this in the catalog. Uh, it's basically a flame retardant jacket that covers my skin. You want to get your suntan from the beach, not from your welder. That's about all I'm going to say about that. I've got some welding gloves that go high up on the wrist. Uh, you don't want any skin exposed. You want to make sure that none of that UV exposure from your welding flash gets put on your, on your skin. And right here, here's another reason to wear good welding gloves. You see how that finger is melted? Well, I didn't even feel anything inside the glove. Well, that was hot enough to melt leather. And I don't know, if this was still on the cow, it would have hurt. So <laughs> again, a great reason for protection. Another thing that you want to consider is a really good welding helmet. This is an auto dark helmet. You can see the, the solar panel up here on top. This actually recharges, helped by the, the UV light that comes off of your arc. A shade setting on the side that you can reach up with your, your left hand and, and, uh, and set your shade on the fly if, if, it's, uh, if it's too much or not enough. But I really recommend a helmet like this one because it covers your chin, it covers your ears, and those areas, your neck and your ears and your forehead, it's sensitive. And you can, you can burn yourself quite easily. It's a no-brainer about the shield itself because you've got to protect your eyes. I've personally been an idiot and I've flashed my eyes, meaning that I've burnt the, the outside portion of my eyes. I've ended up in the emergency room. I own it. It's my fault. Um, sometimes your gear can fail, but typically it's just common sense. So that's all we're going to say about safety. Common sense. Do the right thing as far as protecting yourself from exposure. Let's talk about the machine that we're going to be using. This is Eastwood's MIG 175. It's, it's a great little machine. The thing that I like the most about it is, listen, you're not hearing any clicks. These are infinitely adjustable controls. Your MIG wand is comfortable. It's got a trigger. It's got a hook right here that even when you set it down, it's not going to trigger the gun. It's got a hook here to hang it on things if you need to, and it's a nice, comfortable unit. Here's one of the other things. Here's your drive roll. It's got a dual drive roll for three thousandths or for twenty-four thousandths. Tensioner, same thing. It's typical of, of your basic MIG welder. But come up here a little bit, Ken. Camera guy Ken is helping us out today. So what this is is a guide. It's a settings guide. You can pick your gauge of metal, and then these little columns here will tell you exactly kind of where to start. Solid core wire, solid core 
aluminum. It's got a spool gun attachment, which is pretty darn cool. Or you can go with flux core, and you can dial in your welder and give you a great starting point. So you eliminate a lot of the guesswork. Now, there's certain circumstances that are going to dictate that you change the settings, whether you're getting penetration where you want penetration or where your heat affected zone is different, but you can dial that in. The guide on the inside of the lid gives you a really nice starting point. Also, we're using a mix of argon and CO2. It's a 75-25 mix of argon CO2. And you can see right here the gauges. There we go. Now, I'm, I'm going to crack the bottle. Notice that while I'm not welding, I've got my bottle shut off. That's just a practice that, in my opinion, you, you guys should get used to. Shut your bottle down. That way, in case there is an atmosphere leak, you're not going to waste your expensive gases. So, bottle's cracked open. That shows our volume. Right here, I've got it in between 10 and 15. That's going to give me a nice mix. That's going to give me um, the type of shielding that I want. And that's going to be a good starting point. If I've got an air conditioner running or a fan on uh, when it's hot in the summertime, I might kick it up a little bit. But right now, that's a good place. We're, we're inside. I don't have any breezes, so we're good to go there. So, flux core welding. This is a question that comes up sometimes. What about flux core welding? Um, there's nothing wrong with flux core. Flux core is a, it's a viable source for welding or melting metal together. Uh, for restoration work, not my favorite thing. Uh, the reason being is that it's, it's kind of messy. The flux uh, builds up some slag around it that you've got to chip off, uh, and, and it just, it, it seems to to instigate a little bit of porosity in your weld. And there's, to me, there's always the chance that some of that acid or some of the flux is gonna stay in your weld. And it's, it's, in my opinion, difficult to clean off. And in the back of my mind, I don't wanna put fillers and primers over top of that, just for the simple reason that I'm scared to cover it up and it might map through. So for restoration work, flux core, not my favorite thing. However, if I'm building a trailer outside, number one, I don't need to bring a bottle because the shielding is in the flux and it's a little more portable. So yes, there's a good place for it, in my opinion, not in restoration work. So moving on from flux core. By the way, you will be quizzed on this later. MIG stands for metal inert gas. It's a shielding gas. Uh, basically what it's designed to do is push out the oxygen and the contaminants really pure welding zone for your pool to, uh, to form and for your metal to fuse. So let's talk about prep. Just like painting, preparation is everything. Very, very important. So um, a couple of different things. You look at this piece of steel, and it looks like it's in really nice shape. It's nice and clean. Or is it? I can feel a residue on here. And what's more important than that, it's, it's greasy feeling. So when I start to weld that, whatever's on top of that is going to get introduced into my weld. So it, that's a, it's a great idea to clean this off and get rid of that contamination before you even start. Now, a couple of the things that are really good for cleaning off your weld before you, uh, before you begin it's just good old-fashioned acetone. This is available at any drugstore. Uh, you can have it um, sitting on your shelf. I have some in my paint shop for mixing with polyesters. So acetone is a good prep. The bad thing about acetone in the immediate environment of your welding situation or your welding zone is that, you know, you stand the risk of an open fluid container. So there's a, there's a better solution with something like this. This is Eastwood's Chassis Clean. It's an aerosol. And uh, it's really good for its intended purpose, cleaning chassis parts, but it's also a good prep for your metal. And again, when you're using this stuff, you want to wear gloves and you want to make sure that your skin is protected because some of these chemicals can be a little harsh. Another good, raisin, another good way to clean your metal is with a scuffing pad. Once you've cleaned the debris off, you can just dress it down with a scuffing pad and you can see you can see that change color you see that that gets rid of that 
the kind of it gets down into the mill scale without profiling, but it shows you that you can do better. You can, you know, metal looks clean even though it's not. So you can use a scuffing pad. You can use one of these fiber wheels. These guys on an angle grinder work great. This is also a nice one. It's got the twist lock attachment and these guys are really, really handy to have around for a lot of different prep situations. Again, you can put it on an angle grinder. It's a body shop staple, it just has to be. So you can dress down and clean up your weld with one of these guys if you have access to it. One last thing about cleaning and prepping is this. With Eastwood welders come these brushes. These brushes are great. They're a great tool to have around. Um, I've got one labeled MIG and one labeled TIG. And you can just take your work surface and quickly abrade down through and you can see exactly what that does. Now that's going to get rid of any scale or any contamination that's on your surface. Now the reason I've labeled these MIG and TIG is because especially when you're TIG welding, you want to make sure that you keep your TIG welding uh, supplies with your TIG welder. If you cross them over, you can introduce contamination, and TIG is just more sensitive. Just like when you have your tungsten, if you sharpen them on, on a grinder, you want to keep a dedicated grinding wheel for your tungsten. So we're going to put the TIG brush back and never use it again until we're TIG welding. The reason you want to start on a practice sample, you never want to, you never want to practice on your project. You know, if it's a new quarter panel, you've paid several hundred dollars for this quarter panel. And if you're sectioning it on, you don't want to be setting your welder on the quarter panel itself. So I always keep scraps and spare parts and pieces around. But you want to check, you want to check your welder out and test your settings on a similar gauge metal. So, you want to test the gauge on your patch panel and you want to transfer it and make sure that it's the same gauge here. Now this, this might be hard to see because it's, it's a little tricky, but uh, there we go. You can see the gauge is on the right. Now Eastwood has a, a metal gauge and I'm going to 20 gauge. On 20 gauge is a nice tight fit. 22, no. 22, 20 gauge, yes. 18 gauge, it's sloppy. So now we know that this is a 20 gauge piece of metal. This guy is a really nice tool to have around and in my opinion, necessary equipment. Before you start welding, you want to make sure that on top of a clean substrate, you want to make sure that your areas that you're welding together are burr free or dressed down. The tendency is to set everything up Get your patch panel exactly where you want it. And once you've got everything set, well, we get excited. I do. Um, I love this stuff. I love the fact that I'm fixing something that may have been sitting in a field for 45 years. But we get ahead of ourselves, and we have the tendency to just start, just start burning stuff in, just start welding. And um, there's one final step that, that I like to do, and I like to coach people on putting that into their practice, their everyday practice, which is dressing the edge. I've got a demo that I'm going to do for you that illustrates this point exactly. If you look at this metal, dive down here, camera guy Ken, you can see the edge. You see that roughness. This was just cut in a bandsaw or a cutoff wheel. And that roughness, well, is if we looked at that on a microscopic level, you would see the metal standing up. Now, if you start welding that, it can actually promote blow through. Now, blow through, as you guys know, is when your metal just disappears. It just actually almost ignites. Here's what happens. We're going we're gonna to play with fire. <laughs> so, what I've got here, of course, is a, well, it's an open flame. So, I'm going to count. When I introduce the flame to the side of the paper towel, we're going to count. So, we've got one two, three, four. Okay. It took about four seconds to ignite that. I'm going to tear it. So now I've got that same edge that I just showed you on the metal. Now watch what happens. We've got one, 
two, and two seconds, the count of two, I've got an open flame. Now, the reason that happens is because the oxygen is able to get inside the fiber of the paper towel. It's precisely the same thing that happens on your steel. The oxygen and the arc, it sees those frayed metal particles and those strands that upturned edges and it literally starts them on fire. And contrary to uh, what some talk show hosts say, metal does in fact burn. So, you know, we're just controlling the burn with the welder with adding filling, filling rod and isolating it with a nice shielding gas. So, to, uh, to dress your edges and clean them up, you get rid of this and you get rid of the problems that that's going to bring you. Right there. So, let's talk about burning some steel. Again, I promise. I promise we're going to actually weld. Um, but this is important stuff, guys. This can be the difference between success and failure in your project. And uh, very smart people have gently told me and coached me through these things, so I'm trying to pass on some of this cool information that I've learned over the years. Now, one of the things I want to talk about is rehearsal. Basically, when you're going to do a weld, let's see, I'm going to weld this guy to that guy. Now, on the bench top here, this is not as critical. However, when you're on the floor, out underneath a car, inside a trunk, you're doing a floor pan, something like that, you want to make sure you're in what I call a comfort zone. So I want you to rehearse where your weld is going to go. Now whether you push your MIG or you pull your MIG doesn't matter. Here's what I want to say. When you start here with the welder turned off, what I want to do is make sure that I'm in my comfort zone here, that I can reach without straining. Side to side, I'm good to go however I want. I'm in my comfort zone. My comfort zone is between my shoulders. Outside of there, I can't see, I can't tell the angle of my wand, and chances are my welding is going to be compromised. And if that happens and you have porosity, you have gaps, you've got to pour more heat to it, and eventually it's going to compromise your success. So stay within your comfort zone. Create a comfort zone, understand what it is, especially with some of the more challenging uh, some of the more challenging positions that you're going to find yourself into. What I'm doing here, I've got a little bit of lead sticking out. I'm trimming to about a quarter of an inch outside of my wand. That's a pretty good starting point. Your position is about 10 degrees tilt back. Let me get this out of the way. 10 degrees tilt back and close enough to where your shielding gas can push out all that contamination. So. Let's talk about wire. Over here. On this table here, we've got two different grades of wire. We've got 30 thousandths or 030 wire. And you can see fairly well what it is. It's pretty thin and it's not bad for sheet metal. In my opinion, it's better to go with a lighter wire. This is 24 thousandths. Now, this lighter wire, of course, it doesn't add as much filler because the rod's not as thick or the, the, the solid core wire is not as thick. And because there's not as much metal, there's not as much heat, there's not as much electricity that it takes to melt it. So your heat affected zone, the actual pool that you're going to be welding is less. So personally for me, a smaller gauge wire works better for sheet metal. This is live, people, so if you hear me trip over myself or drop tools or, or uh, you know, body gases escape, sorry, that just sort of happens. But um, what we're going to do now is turn the machine on. So I know that we've tested on 20 gauge metal, so I'm going to go back inside the panel. And it doesn't matter how experienced you are, you can look at the instructions every once in a while and it's not going to hurt you. So we've got 20 gauge. I'm 75, 25 argon. and 25 thousandths as far as the range goes. So my settings should be, well, it says E5. Back to the front of the machine. I've got it on E and I've got it on 5. So we should be good to go. So let's make some sparks. What do you say? I got my test piece out here. Now you'll notice that I'm not grounding my test piece. Here's one of the cool thing. 
uh, about these welding tables. These are available for me to it as well. I've got two put together, so I've got a nice large work surface. These are adjustable. You can adjust the plane. They've got clamps. Uh, they've got clamps attached. There's all kinds of cool features for these tables. One of the best things is that you can take your ground, that typically ground your metal, and you can ground the table. And as long as your substrate is contacting the table, then you're grounded. Your circuit is complete. So that's what we're going to be doing today. So we've got a machine set up for 20 gauge. I'm putting my fashion accessories on. Double check my gas. We're good to go. We're going to do a little quick test. Just a couple of tacks. All right, I'm liking that. The sound that you heard, we call it, we call it the sound of bacon frying. It's like a crackle and a pop of that bacon in the cast iron frying pan in your morning. That tells you that everything is, is cooking and burning just right. Come down here and take a look at the weld. You can see the weld. It's nice. The heat affected zone is good. On the back side of it, you can see the penetration. I've blown through nowhere. It's doing well. That's the setting that I wanted for this gauge of metal. So what does that tell me? That tells me that my shielding gas is on because everything's nice and clean, but it also tells me that the guide on the inside of that welder is spot on. So thanks, Eastwood. Here's something that I want you to listen to more than I want you to watch. If you look up here, you can see my microphone. That helps me communicate through the camera. But there's a thing called post flow. You guys that are familiar with welding, with TIG welding especially, post flow is the shielding gas moving on and moving through your wand past the point to where you've stopped depressing the trigger, past the point to where you're introducing electricity and filler rod. Post flow is important because it cleans up as your weld pool is, uh, is shrinking and cooling, post flow will keep those contaminations from getting stuck down into your weld. So listen if you can, right by the mic. There's about three seconds, again, can you hear that, Ken? Yeah, Ken can hear it. Hope you guys can hear it too. But it just illustrates that um, your post flow is working, this welder is set up with it. It's not an adjustment, which is fine. I don't ever have to think about it. But it plays into technique. So I'm going to make another tack, and after the welding dies, watch my position. I didn't do it on the last one, but my tacks in between, I left my wand without moving it. What that does is it makes sure that that shielding gas is staying where you want it, where you want that isolation. So that's a nice habit to get into. So keep your, keep your wand in the same position that you're going to be welding, which ties back into the rehearsal thing. You want to make sure that, you're, uh, that you're, you're in a comfortable position so you can hold still. Now, there's a couple of different techniques I want to talk about. For sheet metal, you're going to be doing a lot of tacking. If you're building a, uh, a trailer, there's a couple of different techniques that you can practice. You can even practice it on sheet metal, but you can see what kind of warpage it causes just on a single sheet of 20 gauge. Now there's a couple of different schools of thought here. I've talked to some of the guys on the TV shows that I work at, and some guys will make a little E as they travel. Some guys will do reverse C's as they travel. Each one is a very effective technique. It's a difference between, I don't know, I can't analogize it, but basically this will get you nice penetration and bridge over the two pieces of metal that you're trying to fuse together. When you're tacking light gauge sheet metal, what I want you to do is timid welding. 
I want you to tack your ends, tack the middle, start doing a little math, split the difference. And I'm going to demonstrate why a little bit later on. As a matter of fact, if you go to the body panel replacement video in the Paintucation series, you'll see this illustrated to where I tack my ends, I tack the middle, I hit the middle of that, and I hit the middle of that, and I hit the middle of that one, and I hit the middle of that one, and I start over, move to the outside edge. What that does, instead of giving me a continuous heat that travels down like this, I'm allowing that metal to cool by jumping all over the place and getting a little bit random. So that allows the metal to cool and kind of go back to where it wants to go. We're telling metal, we're coaching it, we're convincing it, we're loving it into a position that we want it to stay into. And you can go about it two different ways. You can beat the fire out of it and you can, you can manhandle that sucker and you can clamp it down and kick it and, 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 and then beat it back into submission after you're done welding or you can zen out just a little bit and you can use air, you can use heat, you can use uh, spacing, you can use time in order to do the same job with a whole lot less work after the fact. So when I refer to timid welding, it's not because you're afraid to weld, you're just letting your tacks cool in between them and allowing the metal to kind of bounce back to where it was where you started, to where you place it and where you put it and eventually it will lead to a better repair for you.